Europa had been burning due to the Great War. The Bremen Empire and the Eastern Union had been in direct full military confrontation for years. But at last, there are rumors of peace treaties in the works. The Kaiser of the Bremen Empire had taken control of the small city of Prehavel and immediately started suing for peace. Almost as if the entire war had been a pretext to occupy the city. Perhaps the Bremen Empire and the Kaiser knew that there was something special, or rather different, there. Could the Bremen spies in the city have informed the Empire that there was a reason that the Eastern Union had built miles and miles of bunkers underneath the city? Perhaps the spies of the Empire, working at the Prehavel Museum, passed on information about some secret structure underneath the museum? Why would anybody need to move heavy digging equipment to a museum that's in the center of a city? There had to be something underneath there, underneath the city. What was so important that the course of the war would pivot on this small, unremarkable, old-fashioned city? Rumors had made it out of a project called Logic being worked on by the smartest engineers on the continent. Rebel groups, the Empire, and the Union all seemed fixated on this city. Reports of some machine or tool called the teleletroscope had been intercepted, but no one seemed to know what that was. Fear and Hunger 2 Termina is what you get when you mix the movie Battle Royale, Legend of Zelda's Majora's Mask, and the Cthulhu Mythos. It's a PC survival horror RPG available on Steam. In this video, we'll explore the mysteries of the teleelectroscope, the logic, the machine god, and what happens in one of the endings of Fear Hunger 2 Termina. We will be covering some parts of the endgame in detail, so massive spoilers ahead. If you like a challenge in a dark, fascinating, though cruel world to explore, it's best to explore it with no spoilers. So, if this seems like something you'd be interested in, I recommend you check out the game and then come back. Also, content warning on the game, there are some very adult and mature themes in it. So just a caution if you approach the game that there might be some material you may not be in a state of mind to process. Hi, thank you very much for clicking on my video. My name is John, this is my channel Taco Banana, where I post about stuff that I like. I'm a lifelong gamer and have been a scientist and engineer my entire adult life. As you'll be able to tell by browsing my channel, I'm fascinated by technology and science. Some of the images and video that I'll be including here are AI generated. I already had on my hard drive, so figured why not use it? So just a heads up. So just for transparency. Anyway, here are the words I've prepared in my video essay. What is the machine god? Transition. Fear and Hunger 2 is set about 600 years after the events of the first game, which itself takes place in the year 1400 of this world. The story and lore of the first game is rich, and I won't be able to even cover a small part of it in this video, but I'll try to set you up with what you need to know to understand the events of the second game. In Fear and Hunger 1, four characters, each with their own reasoning, are attempting to separately break into the Kingdom of Rondon's Dungeon of Fear and Horror to rescue Lagarde, the charismatic leader of a mercenary band called Knights of the Midnight Suns. Like Icarus, Lagarde had flown a little too close to the sun and angered the powers that be of the kingdom, which led to him being arrested and thrown into the deepest, darkest dungeon in the kingdom. The prophesized one, already while still alive. There are many tales written and sung about his tale. We don't know where the prophecy got started, but needless to say that it's all fallacy. But the man himself is a curious kind. There is definitely something different about him and whatever his part might be in the greater scheme of things. At the very least, he started something larger. The new gods about Lagarde. Kahara the mercenary, Enki the dark priest, Darcy the knight, and Ragv the outlander descend into the dungeon to find Lagarde only to discover that they had been led there for reasons unknown to them. Lagarde had staged the entire situation, his capture and the four rescuers, so that he would end up in the bottom level of the dungeon with people capable to help him complete his expedition. Lagarde knew the dungeon's greatest secrets and the reasons the dungeon had descended into a storm of violence and miasma. You see, there was a door, a special door, at the very bottom of the dungeon that only opened to the holder of a very special cube. A cube that Lagarde had destroyed Rag's hometown to steal. Behind this ancient door waited the ancient city of Mahabre, the city of gods. Mahabre was the ancient city where the Fellowship had traveled to in the year 800, a full 600 years before the events of Fear and Hunger 1. 
and over a thousand years before the Festival of Termina in Part 2. An ancient city that still held traces of the new and old gods that existed on its own in space and time. It felt like a city that should not be able to exist, at least not this far underground. See, in the world of fear and hunger, it is possible for mere humans to rise to be gods, or so they thought. And it was in, in Mahabre where they would come with their aspirations of godhood. And Lagarde was the most recent in that tradition. He had engineered all this just to get himself closer to the ancient city and allow himself ascension to godhood. He told himself that the ends of merit the means as long as he got more power. But it was for a good cause, he told himself, maybe honestly, maybe naively, that if he were able to ascend and become a god, he'd be able to bring order and stability to the people in the land, and thus lessen their suffering. It always seems to start with the best of intentions, doesn't it? Lagarde, like the new gods and the fellowship before him, also wanted to ascend to godhood in order to rival the power of the old gods. While the new gods were humans that had touched the powers of the gods and had ascended, the old gods were different. They were not born in this world. They were part of the very fabric of existence. Creation, destruction, nature, the depths, and rare, the trickster moon god. They each represented basic concepts of existence. They also represented it, the targets of the ire of humanity for all the plagues, famines, disaster, tragedies, and wars that humanity had had to endure. Since the beginning of time, humans have been trying to find a way to end the chaos and bring order and take the power away from the gods to gain control over chaos. One of the new gods, a member of the Fellowship, was also working on a secret scheme, another avenue of attack against the old gods. Sired by Lagarde, she would birth another ancient one and give rise to a new god, one that might be able to stand against the old ones, the god of fear and hunger. A soul that radiates the light of an older god, the soul has formed itself inside the body of a little girl. The mother of the ancient one is the endless one, and the father is the man from the prophecies. The result of such an unholy union are unfamiliar to us. The new gods, when asked about the ancient one, one of the possible endings of Fear Hunger 1 sees the birth and ascension of this new god, born of Lagarde and Novian, and carrying the ancient soul. The birth of the god of fear and hunger marked a new era for humanity, the beginning of the Cruel Age. The four ages of history, the modern age and modern chronology, begins from the birth of our lord, the Ascended One, Almer. His birth would mark the First Age. The Second Age started from the reign of the so-called New Gods in the year 410. There are texts about different New Gods prior to this event, and the concept did exist in ancient times as well, but this group of people included the famed warlord of the Eastern Sanctuaries, Nasra the Great. This alone made this group more distinguished compared to the ones that came before. Their world order started a slow decline a few hundred years after their deaths, only to be ended by the Fellowship around the year 800. The popular book The Fellowship inspired contemporary people of the time and lifted the four people of the Fellowship, Francois, Chambara, Novin, Valteo, to near godlike status. Their age would last until the end of the 16th century. The Western world was at a dark age at that time, and out of nowhere appeared a new idol of worship the god of fear and hunger. People forgot the teachings of the old in times of disease and death and turned on to this new savior. The appearance of the god of fear and hunger started the fourth age in which mankind had to learn to adapt and evolve. As time progressed, we are still living according to this ideology. Little is detailed about the cruel era in the games of Fear and Hunger 1 and 2. You don't find many mentions of these 600 years in the books scattered across town. It's almost as if humanity had decided to do its best to not remember these times. What we do know is that Lagarde was out there. Well, maybe not Lagarde as we knew him in part 1, but rather the king in yellow doing what he would do to further his goals. But whatever it was, it was discreet, since he seemed to have stayed out of the history books. During the cruel era, in response to famine, plague, disasters, and other such tragedies, humanity was forced to evolve and adapt. Forced to understand and study the rules of the world and use them to their advantage. Use it to gain leverage, with the goal of bringing order and stability out of chaos. Humanity started developing science, technology, and engineering. 
the guard and humanity both sought order and stability, for this is how societies grew and thrived. So humanity built more cities, machines, industries, factories, all with the goal of making life a little bit more manageable and easier. Maybe with these new tech tools, humanity would finally be able to wrestle control away from the gods and take control of its own destiny. Could technology be what humanity needed? to finally wage an assault on the old gods and take control? Could sufficiently advanced technology and determined enough people be enough to challenge the very basic concepts and fabric of existence? And so we arrive at the events at the beginning of the game. The game begins with a train traveling to Prehaville, carrying our unlucky protagonist, 14 of them, the recently conquered capital of the Bohemian region, the city that the Kaiser seems to have been solely focused on. One by one, they fall asleep listening to the melodic repeating sounds of the train running down the track. They each have a nightmare, the same nightmare. A nightmare that included a masked man who had been showing up in the dreams of the locals for the last few weeks. In the city, you might find a flyer about this man. Have you seen this man in dreams? Over the past week or so, since the full moon, people all over Prehaville and its neighboring settlements see this face in their dreams every night. If you are one of them, or if you have any information that can help us identify this person, please contact us. In the dream, this mysterious man, the Moon's Jester, explains to our unlucky protagonist that they have been chosen to participate in the Festival of Termina by the trickster Moon Rare. Today, the four team of them are alive. At the end of three days, there must only be one of them and that survivor would be the winner of the Festival of Termina. If there was more than one of the participants still alive at the deadline, they would all die. One by one, the participants wake up from the dream. The train is stopped outside the city and has been deserted. No evidence of the crew or anybody else in the area. Just a thick fog covering the woods on the outskirts of the city. The train won't start and there's no obvious reason why. Everything looked fine. Abella, the engineer, checked it out and couldn't find any issues with it, in spite of her expertise and mechanics. How did they all have the same dream? Where was the crew of the train? Why wouldn't it start? Why had they stopped short of their destination? The war was supposed to be over. There wasn't supposed to be any more fighting. What happened? The participants realized that they are walking distance from the city. At least the train had gotten them almost all of the way there. The thick fog made it impossible to see more than a few meters, but they had enough visibility to one by one stumble their way into the city, fumbling through the forest. Though Prairieville is a regional capital, it's an old and reclusive city, slow to modernize. Its inhabitants still adhere to the ancient traditions, practicing old and dark rituals to honor the ancient deities, including human sacrifices. Prairieville was a medium-sized city with a massive tower at its center a tower that seemed important to the locals, though they wouldn't talk to outsiders about it. Per Heville document, there have been settlements here for as long as the history books cover the area. It has always centered around the mysterious hollow tower that works as a central pillar of the community. The city flourished during the cruel age in the 1600s, but it quickly fell from prominence the closer we got to modern times. I understand the city is medium in size as far as cities in Eastern Europa go. But still, I find it hard to believe that this place would serve as a hub of any kind in a civilized world. For some reason, the government officials insist that Preville keep its capital identity, despite being one of the most remote and unwelcoming cities in all of Bohemia, if not all of Europa. The only explanation I can come up with is that the country is proud of its old archaic rites that still go down in the city and they want to show their full support. If you were to visit Preheville and sightsee its small center, you'd see glimpses of its ancient glory days, still well and alive in these modern days. Do not let the western style shopping districts with its latest movie posters and advertisements fool you. The locals still worship the old world order in the dank and crumbling parts of the city. Ritualistic murder sites are still around the corner no matter where you are in the city. While the churches look dedicated to our one true god Almer from the outside, insides tell a different story. Ancient gods without name in any known language still linger in these crypts. And why wouldn't they? You can hear the priests chant their masses in the moonlight alleys during the dead of night. The whole wicked city is a playground for the ancient beings and the people living there offer themselves to the first taker without a second thought. 
In the Soder's diary, we read, Frankly, I'm baffled at how a city of this size has managed to stay isolated from neighboring influences in modern time. The Preheville folk still hold on tightly to religious rites as old as the fellowship itself. Human sacrifices creep me out in this day and age. Even if I've seen the horrors of war, the crucifixes set around the city manage to send a chill down my spine. As the participants approach the city, they very quickly realize something is gravely wrong. The woodsman is an obvious first warning sign. As they approach the city, the remaining surviving locals look distraught, transformed, radiated? No. Burned. Poisoned? No. None of the above. They have been moon scorched. Some of the non-violent ones were even peeling flesh off of themselves. What was it? What happened here? An experiment? A disaster? Was this intentional? Natural? Scientific? Was the entire city like this? What else was hidden behind this thick fog? The ones coherent enough to speak made a reference to being scorched, but by the moon? How does that happen? Was the moon also responsible for this green hue to the fog at night? We find the soldier's letter, and it reads, Dear Gisela, I write this letter in great sadness. I'm afraid I will have to postpone my return to your loving bosom. Even if the Great War is supposedly over, our task seemed to be anything but. After running around following orders that would sicken every sane person who had not witnessed the horrors of war. I think I finally started to see the red line our Kaiser has been following all along. This rotten city. It was the very thing our Kaiser strived to conquer since day one. I do not think it was a coincidence that very soon after reaching the city, the Kaiser decided to withdraw Bremen forces elsewhere and agree on terms of peace. I don't know what's so special about this miserable place, but I even heard that the Kaiser himself will be coming here in upcoming days. Maybe after that, I can return home. I hope you're able to wait for me just a little longer. Yours forever, Joni. So obviously, the local population has suffered under the recent invasion and occupation by the Bremen Empire. Parts of the city were demolished by combat and have been mined. Executed bodies in the street show the handiwork of the Bremen soldiers and the brutality visited upon the local population. Barricades prevented free movement on the main roads. All that aside, the brutality of the Bremen Empire and its army didn't explain the green fog at night, or what transformed the surviving locals, or what was driving the people of Preheville to hyper-violence and homicidal rage. The occupation didn't explain why the locals were turning on each other. Was there something more at play than some military occupation? Was the Kaiser really here, as rumors and intelligence reports suggested? Why would he be somewhere so dangerous, so close to the front lines? What caused these monsters to be roaming the street, hunting the locals? Exploring the city, restaurants, shops, and apartments, you catch glimpses of a city that once was and is no longer. The echoes of the lives that once called this place home. At different spots in and around the city, you keep finding these latches that lead to underground tunnels. Apparently, when the Eastern Union controlled the city, they had constructed a series of bunkers that crisscrossed the city. Why? Why invest so much in building these tunnels underneath this unremarkable city so far away from the centers of power? Especially during a time of total war. Couldn't the Eastern Union better spend its resources on the war effort? And not digging underneath some city? What lies underneath? The game, like so many survival horror games, is a series of lock and key puzzles. A variation on having to find X amount of keys to get past a certain lock. Move to the next area and repeat. So first, starting off the game, you need two keys to get into the city proper. That is, if you don't get into the city via the sewer or the path through the deep forest shortcut. Once in the main part of the city, you have to collect three effigies hidden in the orphanage the white mold apartments, and underneath the Church of Almer to be able to continue on and get to the endgame area. The church effigy puzzle reminds me of the police station puzzle Resident Evil 2, where you have to collect some obscure item relating to the decoration to unlock your pass through the building. The game plays like a roguelike, so you're expected that you'll be playing a lot of runs throughout your time with the game, each time learning more about the world, mechanics, and events. You have three days until the Festival of Termina ends, and all the surviving participants get moon scorched and turned into different types of abominations. Each day is divided into three sections, morning, afternoon, and night, and time is advanced by saving the game. This adds an extra layer of tension and strategy to the game, since you will only have eight saves that you can use by resting. 
and each time you save, you have to ask yourself if you've done enough to create a save point or do you want to risk it and press on. The more you can get done in between saves, the more buffer you buy yourself in the end game. You don't want to hit the evening of the third game and still have to do a lot of puzzles and traveling the dangerous world before even attempting the end game, all without saving. And all this is besides if it's even safe to try to save the game. Since if there are any enemies around that you haven't cleared out, they might surprise you while you're resting. And if you try to rest on the evening of the last day, you will see your character moon scorched and turn into an abomination. So once you lock the gate and the path at the Church of Almer, you can go for the endings at the tower or the museum. If you're the only surviving participant, not judging how that happened or how the other participants met their end, you will be allowed into the tower to confront Perkele and the Moon God to get the escape ending. But if you explore the underground, found all three teletroscope stations that are connected to the logic and activated them, you'll be able to access the other ending at the White Bunker, where you'll find the Kaiser waiting for you. The telescopes have to be activated across the map. One is in the first bunker where Bella can be recruited, one past the sewer treatment puzzle and the foundations of decay, and the third in the bunker hidden in the deep forest. The game doesn't explicitly tell you how to unlock the blast doors to the white bunker, like it explicitly tells you about the keys to the gate or the passage at the Church of Almer. Though the game does strongly give you a hint by placing the first teletroscope at the very beginning of the game with a critical item right in front of it. One of the two keys needed to get past the first gate is found right in front of the console that activates one of these stations. This was placed there to catch the player's attention and have you start wondering what it's connected to and what the logic is. So at the end of the game, you've made your way to the museum, past all the creepy party goers in their Venetian style mask, making it look like a haunted Mardi Gras that I never want to attend. You'll have to solve the astrological clock puzzle. Side note, it seems like this clock, and actually the entire city, might have been loosely inspired by Prague, which is in the real world bohemian region of Eastern Europe. Unlocking the clock puzzle, you go underneath the museum and you find a secret excavation there and discovering massive blast doors preventing you from entering the white bunker. Members in your party might make the observation that it seemed like this area had been sealed off, only recently excavated and accessible. An excavator nearby only drives home the suspicion that there had been a lot of recent work digging up a path to this blast door. This is the last stop in your ordeal in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. One of the endings is behind this blast door. So, having visited all three teleelectroscope stations and activated them, the blast door is functional and active. With hesitation and doubt, we open the blast door, enter the white bunker, and the end game has commenced. Unfortunately, the protagonist and anybody else in the party is unaware that regardless of how the game ends, they would never leave the bunker again and see the outside world. At this point, we should take it aside to go over some of the late game findings that flesh out some of the details about the secret project being carried out underneath the city. You find the NLU Reconnaissance Report number 2. It details the information on Riley Audrey Haas a brilliant young engineer, sister to Olivia Haas, that had been recruited for Operation Logic in Bohemia and promoted to the position of head engineer in the operation. Eventually, when the Bremen Empire expanded their control over the region, she was arrested for treason against the Empire and held for interrogation. There, the Kaiser and the Bremen Empire were able to get information about Operation Logic from her. Eventually, the NLU was able to break her out of the East Bremen State Prison. At that point, she was marked as a person of special interest by the Kaiser. With all its might, we assume that the Empire was able to eventually capture her again. Rayla Haas. So that was the girl that we've been having visions of. She's the one that's been placing the blue butterflies to mark our way to the teletroscope stations to get us to power them up. Was she trying to get us to finish setting everything up for her final ascension to machine godhood? She was also Olivia's sister. Olivia is one of the participants of the festival and was on the train. The botanist seems like an inclination towards the sciences runs in the Haas family. A quick aside that I wanted to make here, and something I like about the games of Fear and Hunger, is the representation. In the first game, the character that fills the knight archetype is a woman, Darcy. In the second game, Abel is an engineer, 
Olivia and Rayla are scientists. Olivia is also disabled, needing a wheelchair. Not that it slows her down, and she can become a very powerful character. Levi is a trauma victim and a child soldier who's coping with addiction. Marina is a badass occultist, in spite of her being looked down upon for being a trans woman. Marco, in spite of being a large, muscular fighter, comes off as very empathetic, contrary to his fighter archetype. Karen, though born an aristocrat, is a selfless activist. Kahara, in the first game, is not at all possessive of his partner and goes to the dungeon trying to provide for his partner an unborn child. In fact, now that I think about it, most of the playable characters in both games come off as pretty good empathetic people. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. So in the white bunker, you press on, you fight your way past the elite of the Bremen army, protecting the leader of your empire at all cost. You continue further down to the bunker, dodging these fucking insta kill enemies that have only now been introduced. Seems like it's the game just reminding you not to get too comfortable in case you are feeling like a badass at the end of the game. Trying to find clues and digging through notes, you discover what the teleletroscope had been connected to. Rows and rows of data banks and servers. The white bunker was in part a massive data storage facility that had been wired to the entire city. On the desk, you find a report. Teleelectroscope and the logic. Teleelectroscope, an interconnected computerized system which documents our lives and extracts information from our consciousness. The data is abstracted from banks of every person in the whole human system. The logic. Logic works as a center for the teleelectroscope, a core in this world where all knowledge and inspiration comes from and goes to. A data tank which possesses all knowledge and it provides people with said information as they need it. The future of the teleelectroscope. People become obsessed with these fake friends who exist in the walls. Ultimately, people will begin to shun personal contact, preferring to interact with each other via machine technology. People would rather stay in the world created by our shared consciousness. The logic is designed so that each individual human in the system will affect the surrounding world, thus creating a shared paradise, a shared consensus. So at long last, we get a glimpse about what all this was about. The Kaiser and the Eastern Union have found something underneath the city of Preheville that would allow them to build a wonder machine, a supercomputer, a machine god. As Lagarde says, we cannot control the world laid down by primal forces, but we can build a new one. The singularity, our personal promised land awaits. To which Nazra replies, but I can have a rectal extension like yourself leading us to jack shit. The logic was a god to turn to when direction or guidance was needed, that saw all, that knew all. But unlike the new or the old gods, the new machine god was built by humans, empowered by science and technologies that humanity developed in response to the cruel age. A weapon that the Kaiser, the guard, could use against the old gods, or the traces that remained of the old gods. He never wavered from his goal for more than 500 years. The Kaiser had invaded Preheville, kidnapped and interrogated Rayla, and did who knows what to make her merge with the new machine god. Was Lagarde trying to be like Prometheus and steal something from the gods to gift to humanity? Having made it past all the guards and the rows of data banks, you make it to the bottom of the white bunker. You fight the platoon and commander, Having defeated them, you encounter the Kaiser and overcome him as well. All this just in time to see the machine god take her true and final form as she came online. The culmination of all the Kaiser's plans. After a long and difficult fight, you manage to beat the machine god, maybe deactivate her. You don't know, but you lose consciousness. You come to, and you seem to have a dream where you are in a green stream of consciousness connected to everything and everyone. A global network of people, a shared consensus of humanity. 
The machine god welcomes you to paradise, and the brave protagonists that enter the white bunker are never seen again. Had they thwarted Lagarde or merely delayed him? Had they actually defeated the machine god or only delayed its ascension? Could humans ever dare take on the old gods? Could humanity use science and technology to impose order on our chaotic world, where the old forces of chaos of the universe too much for humanity to ever be able to rival? It's hard not to think about analogies to where our society is. Soon, most of us will never have known a time when data was scarce and limited to books and print media, where it was normal to be completely separated from the global networks of communication for long periods of time. In time, there will be no one left alive that can remember the four faceless gods of the algorithms dictated so much about what we see, hear, read, and eventually think. What will it mean for us to elevate these technologies that will soon be able to mimic the human brain and generate art, text, video, images, and music that imitates our human expression? What will it mean that our new machine gods are able to provide for us things that we cannot distinguish from, from the real thing? What happens when there's no distinction between the real and the virtual? What would reality be then? What would be the result of our embrace of virtual realities that only exist on computer networks? What is lost when ideas and personalities can carry out completely synthetic lives on global networks? Must we be careful with what we elevate to godhood? So that's my video trying to break down a little bit about the ending of Fear and Hunger 2, what Lagarde was up to, and what the Machine God is. Thank you very much if you've made it all this way to the end of the video. I really appreciate it and I hope you've enjoyed it. What do you think? What do you think the Machine God represented? You think I'm right in my analysis? Or do you think I'm misreading something? Let me know in the comments. Either way, I appreciate your having watched. Thank you very much for joining me and you have a good one. And if you think I should be doing more of this type of content, please like and subscribe. It's always a big help for a growing channel. Do you welcome our new robot overlords? Later.